Beautiful drive. It's through for three. Benny Johnson shoots the Pistons up a deuce. Umar, sideline left. He's trapped over there. Bounces inside. No look to Tarot. He scoops. He scores. What a pass by Dumar. out of a trap. Wire taps it away, though. Mahorn picks it up. Dishes sideline left to Mark. The rainbow goes. The 1988-89 Detroit Pistons ruled the basketball world. They were the object of affection by the city of Detroit and the state of Michigan. But they were loathed outside of it. It was a roster that reflected the image of the city it represented. A tough-as-nails blue-collar squad that put the success of the team first and second and third. The ultimate success for this group could only be realized by one accomplishment, an NBA championship. The undisputed leader on the floor and heart and soul of the Pistons was Isaiah Lord Thomas III. In his eighth year in the league, the captain averaged over 18 points and eight assists per game. He entered the playoffs playing with a broken left hand suffered in an early April brawl with the Bulls' Bill Cartwright. Mid left to Cartwright, wheeling inside, and he missed the reverse. Bang all over Isaiah. Cartwright and Isaiah go at it in front of the Piston bench. I don't believe Cartwright's reaction. Doug Collins is out there. Chuck Daly is out there. It has exploded here. Late in the first quarter, Bill Lambeer gets Isaiah out of there. And Mahorn pulls Cartwright away. And now Chuck Daly's taking a deep breath. Ditto for Doug Collins. And the officials will have to sort it out. Throughout the season and the playoffs, it was the clutch performances of Isaiah that led the way to the Pistons' success. The year we won it, we beat Jordan, Bird, and Magic. <laughs> okay, so in the 90s, if, if, if we were doing it like they do it today in the 90s, where it's, you know, Shaq versus Barkley, and, the, you know, it would be okay. I beat Magic Bird and Jordan. <laughs> Joining Isaiah in the backcourt was fourth year guard Joe Dumars. He was one of two Pistons named to the NBA's first team all defensive squad. Joe D averaged over 17 points per game, shooting 51% from the field. His 27-point three-point average in the finals earned him MVP honors. In the Central Division clinching win at Cleveland in early April, Joe drilled the Cavs for 42 points. Here comes Dumars up the middle against Darnell Valentine. Spins foul line, leans in, scoops dotted line. No, tapped up by Dumars himself, and he hit it. What a play by Joe. Isaiah picks it back up on the dribble. Bounces topside, Dumars trying for three, and it's through! Dumars with an incredible corner. He has 36 points. Dumars proved to be a dangerous weapon in the Pistons' three-guard arsenal that not only had talent going for it, but chemistry as well. We did a couple things uh, well um, that I think made us a pretty good trio. Number one, I th each one of us understood how to play the game, and that sounds very simple, but a lot of times people don't understand the game. Uh, you may see good athletes, but they don't, they're not really smart about the game. I think all three of us were very smart players. We understood how to play, what to do, when to do it. Uh, and secondly, I think we played well together. I think we messed well together, uh, and that was from communication. Rounding out the best three-man backcourt in league history was Vinny Johnson. The microwave heated things up coming off the Pistons bench to average nearly 16 points over the final 59 games of the season. In a March 1st game against Utah, Vinny shaked and baked the Jazz for 34 points. In that game, he set the all-time Pistons record for consecutive points 
with 19 in a row to finish the first half. Right on long, his shot blocked by John. Pistons boarded way ahead to Vinny. A pull up, gut in the lane, got it! He's seven for nine in the quarter. BJ would have started on just about any other NBA team, but sacrificed for the chance to be a champion. You have to be mentally strong, and you have to be willing to play both ends of the court. You have to be willing to sacrifice. Uh, you have to be willing to play roles certain times, and uh, sometimes you have to be willing to step up, and you had to step up and fill somebody else's shoes because of an injury or wherever it may be, a foul trouble or somewhat. Uh, but you had to be strong because we didn't really uh, – give anybody any breaks on that team. But if you didn't show up and be ready to play, uh, we would let you know that. Anchoring the front court was one of the most despised players in the NBA. Bill Lambeer had been hanging with the NBA's biggest and best for nine seasons and 685 straight games. That streak came to an end when Bill drew a one-game suspension for a scuffle with Brad Doherty. Beer jumps on him on a switch. Harper inside, now this is deep right. Nance, 18-foot gun goes. 57 of 41. We got a fight. Lambeer and Doherty really going after it. Doherty's on the floor. Lambeer on top of him, and so now are four Cavaliers on top of Bill Lambeer. And I can almost assure you those two are gone. And it's kind of sad because it's going to take some of the significance from this game. Both centers, I'm sure, George, will be ejected. There were some pretty nasty blows thrown in there. Lane Beer caught one right across the face. He led the team in rebounding with just under 10 per game and continued to drive defenses crazy with his pinpoint accuracy from the outside. But it wasn't just Bill's skills, it was his attitude that set the tone. Everybody changes over time, and uh, in my basketball career, at, uh, I was a very good complimentary player, and then became a leader when I had to, and um, if that meant making sure that everybody else was there every night mentally and physically to play basketball and be a, a, a tough guy or a... Um, uh, sometimes being a real asshole at times to the players and make sure that they showed up every night. That was my role and I accepted it. The other half of the meanest duo in pro basketball was Rick Mahorn. His bone-jarring picks and menacing presence in the paint gave opponents second thoughts about taking the ball to the hole. He and Bill Lambeer were the true inspiration behind the bad boys. Cleveland with eight turnovers, the Pistons with just five as Vinny flies it up over Harper. No. Yes, he made sure with a slam. That was a putback. We came out to work every night. It was, it was the image of being a bad boy. We didn't take any mess. We played very hard, aggressive basketball, and that just set the tone. We, uh, Bill Lambert and myself, we set the tone. If you're coming in the middle, this was our home. We didn't want anybody to come in here and disrupt it, so we just protected home, and I guess they labeled us the bad boys. In his first full season as a Piston, James Edwards was a constant threat in the pivot. Though he wasn't the primary scorer in the Detroit attack, his teammates knew when the going got tough, they could always climb aboard the Buddha train. Isaiah lobbing to Edwards, mid on the right. Wheels and hits the left hand hook. Mid left to Edwards, dotted line, turn and gun, goes, counted and he's fouled. Starts down the right side, now flips it low post Jimmy. Jump hook, baseline right, yes. Man, is he playing well. In the NBA's biggest trade of the season, the Pistons acquired Mark Aguirre on February 15th for Adrian Dantley. With the three-time All-Star in the starting lineup, the Pistons won 44 of 50 games. His 19 points per game came from everywhere on the floor, 
bringing Detroit its most versatile offensive front court threat in years. Lampier boards to Vinny, way up to Aguirre, down the lane. A flying scoop over Harper, and he scores! Yeah, running down the drain. Going wherever it leads. Running down the drain. Two players in their third seasons as Pistons were known as the X Factor. It was just karma, you know. I just think that uh, collectively we um, we just came together to say, you know, we go on and be the energizer bunnies and go out there just, just just give a lot of energy. John does all the shot block, and I do all the the antics on on the side and and uh, try to create havoc for everybody else. And basically, that's what it was. Dennis Rodman and John Sally injected energy into the Pistons' attack. Nice bounce back outside the warm. Thought about the three. Now he'll take it. And he sticks it. A triple from the top for Dennis Rodman. Backdoor. Alley oop to Sally. That's the Sally oop. The Spider could change the game in an instant with his shot blocking ability. He could also run the court better than any 6'11 player in basketball. Chuck said, look, yeah, you scored pretty good in college, but we need you to run the court, block shots, rebound. I'm going to put you in maybe for 17 minutes or 22 minutes. You need to do all of that within that 22 minutes. He said, when I put Dennis and you in, this is what you're going in the game for. So, I mean, I said, hey, whatever it takes to win, if me blocking shots and being able to play anybody on court and being a spark was important to win a championship, people can say, yeah, but you only average seven points, eight points, but they don't have one of these or two of these. The Worm was Detroit's other first-team all-defensive member. He finished second in the league for Defensive Player of the Year and Sixth Man Award. At Golden State in mid-February, Dennis had one of the best games of his career, scoring 32 points and hauling down 21 rebounds. He led the NBA in field goal percentage, shooting 59% from the field. For the, the bad boys, I think it was more like just going out there and just playing basketball. Who cares? He made all the money or whatever. We just wanted to win a championship. And uh, uh, Chicago's the same way. You know, we really don't care. You know, we know Mike's going to make all the money. Scott and then me and, you know, down the line. So, you know, we're just all about going out there and being, uh, being, being good. Providing valuable experience to the Pistons roster was the veteran shooting guard from Romulus, John Long. In his ninth year, John returned for his third stint with the Pistons late in the season after starting the year with the Indiana Pacers. Rounding out the roster were rookies Fennis Dembo and Michael Williams. Dembo, a first-round pick from Wyoming, played in 31 games, while Williams from Baylor saw action 49 times. And the way you look to the man in charge of meshing all this talent into a championship unit was Chuck Daly. Daddy Rich had orchestrated six straight playoff appearances for the Pistons and watched the team mature from a squad just happy to be there to one on a title crusade. Along the way, there were plenty of setbacks. But that only made the team stronger, according to the Pistons' captain. The things that he allowed me to do as a player, the growth that he allowed me to have, and the freedom that he allowed me to have, you know, if I would have had another coach who would have tried to, like, stifle that or control that, you know, or scream and holler at me, you know, it, it, it probably wouldn't have worked. But Chuck was, was perfect because he allowed all of us to grow up and be men and win. They were very strong-minded, there was no question. It was a strong group, and that's what made them successful. And I realized that and realized that, you know, my ego wasn't too involved. We all have an ego to a certain point, but it was more about winning basketball games and let them perform than getting my way all the time. Some point, I was all about team. I've always been about team, and I've always been about professionalism. And when I see a team coming together and functioning the way they should, then you kind of, you know, you kind of take, you go where it leads you. Choosing the ingredients for this championship recipe was general manager Jack McCloskey. 
in his 10th season in Detroit, Trader Jack finally saw all of his hard work pay off in the ultimate sense. Probably the best word is mutual respect. Uh, uh, I got the players, Chuck coached the players. And that's basically, it, it, it was very simple. And uh, I, I don't think we ever uh, uh, went into anybody else's area that, that shouldn't have been. What I seen in Jack was an intensity and a desire. You know, there was a commitment from this man, and you can see the passion within him in terms of how bad he wanted to win and how hard he was willing to work to achieve that goal. You know, I knew every night that I went to bed, Jack was working trying to improve the team. The design was to acquire the best possible players we could, either through trade, the draft, or uh, free agency, which wasn't in vogue particularly, you know, at that time. But uh, we acquired Bill Lambeer because he was a powerful force rebounding, tremendous rebounder and very physical player. Uh, we acquired uh, Dantley and uh, Aguirre because they were post-up people and could score. But uh, all those acquisitions we had over the years, uh, uh, th they were by design to get the best player, you know, in that particular position. Whenever Jack would walk into the locker room, you know, I bet you if you sat me, Vinny, Joe, Lamb, James, Dennis, Sally, Chuck, if you set us in the locker room today and Jack McCloskey walked in, we all do this. <laughs> they were tough. They were aggressive. Uh, they were a throwback to uh, uh, the old days too. When you came down, I mean, when you came down the gut, you know you weren't going to get a layup. You were going to get hit, and you had to go to the foul line. But you weren't going to get a layup. And a lot of people, a lot of teams, you know, were very concerned about playing the, the bad boys. And they talk big, say, well, we're going to be physical with them, but they back down. This is the Pistons Hall of Fame located inside the Palace Atrium. And, as you can imagine, a prominent part of the display is devoted to the Pistons' two championship teams. I'm George Blaha, and I had the honor of calling every game of those two unbelievable years. This coming season is the 10th anniversary of Detroit's first basketball championship. All year long, we'll celebrate the accomplishments of the bad boys. Each month, members of the 1989 World Champs will return to the Palace to be honored, to reflect on that magical season, and to meet with the fans. It'll culminate one night late in the season, when all members of the Bad Boys will come together for what promises to be a very special once-in-a-lifetime ceremony. One way to guarantee yourself a place at the Palace for all of these magical moments is with Pistons season tickets. To renew, contact your sales representative or call 248-377-0100. And if you renew one-third payment by the 1st of July, you'll also receive a very special limited edition gift from the bad boys. Don't delay. Call today. And let's now go back in time to the 1988-89 season when the Pistons ruled the basketball world. The 1988 playoffs proved to be a breakthrough point for the Pistons. Hail to the new Eastern Conference Kings, the Detroit Pistons, finally. 31 years it took them. And the celebration has begun. McHale and Thomas, what a picture that is. I'm sure is what Mikhail is telling the Pistons. And now they're going to have to gear themselves up for a different opponent, a quicker opponent, L.A. The game's over. Detroit.
Detroit wins. The first trip to the NBA Finals proved heartbreaking. A seven-game series loss to the L.A. Lakers could have broken an ordinary team. Kareem is in for A.C. Green for his offense. Four-second differential between the clock you see and the shot clock. Rodman is guarding Magic. Worthy setting a screen. Picked up by Sally on a switch. Kareem. The old man goes up and misses the shot, but goes to the line with 14 seconds to go and a chance to give the Lakers the lead. Bill Lane Beer has fouled out of the game. That's number six. Robbed, I think, to me, connotates a criminal offense. And I don't think the referee who made the call at the end of the game uh, was a criminal. I think it was, he, he made a mistake. And it cost us a championship. Uh, that, was, that was very disheartening. Because all the TV people were down in our locker room, they, they knew we had the championship. And all of a sudden, boy, they're getting all their cameras and everything out of there and putting it in the in the, the Laker, Laker room to talk about their victory. But uh, to say it was robbed, no, I, I, I couldn't say that. But I will say that it took a long time for that referee to look me right in the eyes. The bad boys were anything but ordinary. The team came back with a vengeance during the regular season. Over a million fans passed through the turnstiles of the Palace. Every game a total sellout. The hottest ticket in town. And a death trap for opponents. Off to Isaiah, trapped in backcourt. Long lob to Billy. He'll square up and gun left wing. It goes! Bill Lambeer has 10,000 career points. And he just shut out the light on Washington. Isaiah up the middle, rifle feed inside to Sally for the slam. Detroit won 37 of 41 games at home on the way to a franchise best 63 and 19 overall record. Far and away the best in the NBA. The Pistons closed out the season by winning 27 of 30 games in March and April. In March alone, Detroit triumphed 16 times. Suffering defeat only once. He's trapped over there. Bounces inside. No look to Tarot. And he scoops. He scores. What a pass by Dumars out of a trap. Four and 41 left. Pistons 107. Chicago 93. And the Bulls take time out. Mid courts the outlet to Mahorn. He spins away from Lucas. He'll take it down the oh! line of the hole. I always took the bad boy image as uh, one of physically tough, hard-nosed guys. Uh, just wouldn't back down from anybody. Uh, I think uh, the image took on kind of a life of its own, that uh, we were kind of renegades and uh, maybe cheap shots and, uh, uh, and those type of things. But I never looked at it like that. Uh, when, whenever the word bad boy or that image would come up to me, it was always about just tough in your face and, uh, you know, for 48 minutes we're going we're gonna to do what we have to do to win the game. Oh, I loved it. I like the fact that, you know, we were wearing black and we were the bad guys. I wear black all the time, so I was happy that we were being praised for it. Uh, I like what it did for us. When we walked in places, we intimidated. And even though I had a smile, they knew it was a fiendish, a fiendish smile. So it worked for me. The 1989 NBA playoffs brought more of the same. It's McHale again. Swallowed away by Sally. A great defensive job. BJ from the foul line. Here's the gun. It goes. It's been a Vinnie Johnson night. He has 25. Rodman rebounds. Way up to Sally. He dunks over Parrish. And they're celebrating on the Detroit bench. It's 94-83. Skyle go down on the list of Celtic killers. Great slap away by Vinny. Hustles for the ball at midcourt. Driving on Shaw. Great layoff to Rodman for the dunk. Dishes to Dumars. The Pistons are on their way to the second round. The Pistons easily disposed of the Boston Celtics in an opening round three-game sweep. The Eastern Conference semifinals brought a new challenger, but the same result. Gets it back on top, triple try. It's through for three! Benny Johnson shoots the Pistons up a two. 
goes. There's Pierce again from the baseline. Sally seemed to get a piece of it. Lambeer pulls it off. Dumars alley oops to Rodman. Oh my! Talk about a sky jam. But he's got Moncrief. They loop it to him low inside. Turn him down. Oh, the horn turns it down. One-handed puts it up and in and draws the foul. Off it comes to Vinny up the middle. Behind the back to Sally on the baseline. Back to VJ on the wing. He'll spin foul line, come dotted line, flip it up, it's in and out. Rodman follows, and it falls, and he is fouled. Here's the intentional miss. Ball tapped out. It'll roll across the timeline, and the Pistons will sweep the Milwaukee Bucks. The Bucks went down in four straight. Next up, Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. Led by 32 points from his airness, Doug Collins' team shocked the Pistons in Game 1, handing Detroit its first postseason defeat. In Game 2, the Pistons bounced back in grand fashion. Sally inside for the slam. Way to Isaiah. They rush it up the middle. Isaiah with a stutter step. Now a 360. is for Mark McGuire gets it mid post against Davis. Go to the ball, one inside and jam! Great play by Aguirre. Isaiah Thomas's 33 points led the way in a nine point win, tying the series at one. In the Windy City, game three proved to be a war. And it's called for the offensive foul. Craig Hodges set position in cement. McGuire can't save it. Chicago has it. And McGuire is out of sight right now. Michael Jordan's 46 proved too much for the Pistons as Chicago snuck out a two-point victory and found themselves two wins away from the NBA Finals. With their backs to the wall, the Pistons came back scratching and clawing. Jordan. Robert. And that's what we're talking about when the Pistons want to make Jordan pay whenever he gets in the paint. Shot clock inside 10. Jordan on the sideline. Sets and shoots over the hole to Rodman. At that particular time, uh, Jordan was more of a one-man show than he is right now. At that particular time, he was uh, taking more up on his shoulders just to do it, kind of do it all. And uh, I had the uh, an, enviable, an enviable task of trying to guard him in his prime when he was trying to do everything on his own. Uh, and we basically focused in on him. We had to focus in on, let's go at him. Uh, let's make life miserable for him. Uh, and that's what our focus was. Uh, they obviously have changed since then, and he's, he's still the focus, but not as much as he used to be. But at that particular time, uh, our focus was, uh, let's make life miserable for Michael Jordan. In games four and five, Air Jordan was grounded, connecting on only nine field goal attempts combined for those two games. The Pistons put their attack in overdrive. The Bulls were never going to win again in 89, and the bad boys would make them suffer through three straight defeats. Then he though goes to Sally with it, who finds Dumars in the corner, will spin to the lane. Gun on the run off the glass, no. Edwards with a follow. Great reverse and he's hit it. Oh, Vinny off the screen from Edwards. Inside against Jordan, flips it up, it hands and falls! And he is fouled! In game six, back in Chicago, Jordan did his best to stave off elimination with 32 points. Gives the sellers, gets it. But it wasn't enough to slow down this championship destined team. Wire. Go out of the lane to Dumars. Joe D. Low inside, right to Lambeer. He'll go baseline and hook and hit it. Bounces wide of the lane, left side to Aguirre. He'll back in baseline, turn back to the paint on Sellers. Lost it, but got it back. Shovels to Isaiah. The dotted line push. Yes, it rattled, but it went. He'll send it up from there. It's off the iron. Sally, though, with the board. Here's a follow-up left hand. Hook and he hit it. Dumars on top against Paxson. Screen from Lambeer. Heads down the right side. Goes to the hole. 
Lost it in the air. Came down, got it back. Fished it to Rodman. He'll reverse and hit. Once again, Isaiah drilled home 33 points to blow out the candles on the Windy City party. It up. Dumars across the timeline. Joe G will just dribble out the clock. Four, three, two, one. It's over in Chicago. It's the Pistons in six over the Bulls. And the Pistons are Eastern Conference Kings. What a remarkable run through the regular season and Eastern Conference playoffs. The upcoming season is devoted to recognizing the incredible 1989 campaign. Call the Pistons at 248-377-0100 to reserve your seat for this historical 10th anniversary celebration. The current Pistons of Alvin Gentry will provide all the action during the games against the best in the NBA, and at the same time, Fans will have a chance to look back at one of the greatest teams in league history. One by one, all season long, members of the Bad Boys will return to the palace to be honored and share with the fans their special memories of that unforgettable year. If you send in one-third of your season ticket payment by July the 1st, you'll receive a very special limited edition gift from the Bad Boys. Don't delay. Call today. In June of 1989, the Detroit Pistons returned to the NBA Finals to battle the Los Angeles Lakers. One year ago, the NBA Finals ran the gamut of emotions. For seven heated battles, the Detroit Pistons and the Los Angeles Lakers sparred toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And it was a heroic Isaiah Thomas who led Detroit to the brink of an NBA championship. But whose dreams went unanswered as the poise of the Lakers stood firm, earning them their fifth title this decade. They're being hailed as the team of the 80s. And now the Los Angeles Lakers are seeking to close out this decade the same way they started it, with an NBA championship. They've cruised through these playoffs in spectacular fashion, piling up 11 straight wins and putting them right on course to end the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar era with yet another championship ring. They are billed as basketball's bad boys, but the Detroit Pistons have relied on more than just brawn in reaching the NBA Finals. They have earned the trip the old-fashioned way with a smothering defense that can frustrate anyone. And now, that defense will be unleashed on the Lakers. In a rematch, the Pistons have dreamt about for an entire season. A year ago, we opened the finals at the Forum in Inglewood, California. But this year, the home court advantage belongs to the Detroit Pistons, who battle all year to gain it. And so tonight, in their beautiful new palace, about 35 miles outside of downtown Detroit, it'll be game one of the finals. The Detroit Pistons attracted better than a million fans. And if this championship series gets to game six or seven, they will be played right here in the Palace, unlike a year ago, where the Lakers pulled it out by winning six and seven at their home. So we welcome everybody to the 1989 NBA Finals. Game one between the Los Angeles Lakers and the Detroit Pistons, a series that is rated dead even. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Palace of Auburn Hills for game one of the 1989 NBA Finals. Introducing your Eastern Conference champions, your Detroit Pistons. At one of the forwards, line number 23 from the ball, here's Marco Four from McNeese State. Here's 
is Joe D. The Los Angeles Lakers had swept their way into the NBA Finals. Even with the pre-series loss of Byron Scott, Pat Riley's confident group was talking three-peat. That talk ended minutes into game one. Detroit, they want an up-tempo game. They want to get a lot more shots. And Isaiah Thomas starts it all off. Worthy and Cooper has checked in for the Lakers. Vinnie Johnson uses that sturdy body of his to get a basket and draw the foul as well. Rebound into the hands of Lane Beer. Aguirre with Magic defending. So the two friends brought at each other and the Pistons lead by five. The trapping defense again. They had it a rocket touch pass, Sally. This is the man. Edwards, very tough to start, almost impossible when he gets it going. The Pistons steamrolled the Lakers 109-97 in game one. Foul trouble was a problem for us tonight, but the biggest problem was the Detroit Pistons. They kicked their ass. The Lakers bounced back in game two. Both teams went at it for 48 minutes. L.A. was dealt a severe blow when league MVP Magic Johnson suffered a hamstring pull late in the third quarter. Without their leader, the Lakers managed to step it up and build a nine-point lead late in the third. But the Pistons rallied down the stretch. Rodman from Thomas. Sally now is unworthy, knocks the ball away. And scores the basket. Nice. Aguirre from Thomas. Aguirre to Thomas. Blocked by Thompson. Here's Isaiah with a short jumper. 17 of his 19 in the second half. The Pistons limited the Lakers to only 13 points in the final quarter. Detroit was protecting a two-point lead with two seconds remaining. And James Worthy had a chance to tie the game after being fouled driving to the hoop. There he is tonight, four of six from the line. He needs both to tie it. a timeout. The horn is coming in. They may have to go for a miss here and get the offensive rebound and score to tie it. Well, they just set up their people to do that. He makes the free throw. It's a one-point game, and now the Lakers are going to have to fall foul. The Pistons pulled off a narrow 108-105 victory, led by Joe Dumars' 33 points. Joe D continued his assault in Game 3, netting 31 points, 17 of them in the third quarter. Layup stripped away by Dumars on defense. Talk about playing both ends of the floor. Joe pulls up. He's hot. He's got it. 19 points for Dumars here in the third quarter. Off the screen, Dumars go to the hot man. What a quarter for Joe Dumars. 31 points and 21 in this third quarter. Dennis Rodman was a demon on the boards, hauling down 19 rebounds. The Pistons turned a five-point deficit into a five-point lead with just under two minutes left in the fourth. The Lakers attempted a comeback, pulling to within three with nine seconds to go. It's a three-point game. Joe D, who had done so much damage offensively, finished off the Lakers on the defensive end. You want to get a three, but if you can't, a lot of times teams will go for a quick two and then try to steal or foul quickly. Here's Rivers. Deflected by Dumars. Great defensive play. And a when you plan for everything, and it's about 15, 20 people on the floor, and you look up in the stands, and it's 
20,000 people, let's say, in the arena, and you see about 100 people huddled together just cheering for you. It's just a great feeling. It's like we've come in here and we're going to take on the entire Los Angeles. And, uh, and we, you know, we win the game and all. It's, it's, it's a great feeling to win on the road because uh, you're looking around and you know everybody in there is against you. And you somehow pull it out. It's just a great feeling. I like winning on the road because you're very very core group of people that go with you, your family, your friends. Um, it's a very tight-knit bunch. You're normally who the ones that you surround yourself with are on the roads. And that was really good because if you went back home, everybody and their mother are going to jump into the party. You can't spend time with your friends. And it kind of detracts a little bit from it. The Pistons 114 to 110 victory gave them a commanding 3-0 series lead. Early in game four, the Lakers were looking like their showtime self. Worthy spins his way in. That's seven in a row for James Worthy. They rang up 35 first quarter points on the Pistons. But the final three quarters of the Lakers season turned into a slow, grueling suffocation. The Pistons gradually cut into the lead, tied it, and then ran past L.A. Including regular year. Gets a hurry inside, and Worthy looks at him and says, where did he come from? The horn gets the basket and is fouled as well. Jimmy Johnson gets it to James Edwards. The basket counts and a foul. They got the ball into the big center before the rotation took effect. Runner, here's Ben Johnson, here's Thomas. Yes. He released early on Cooper's shot. And Chuck Daly's Pistons lead at 93 to 87, and the Lakers call a timeout. As the Pistons pulled away to certain victory, the game was put on hold to pay respects to one of the great players the NBA's ever known. That's it for Kareem now. That's it. He's out. In his last championship series in his 20th season, Kareem averaged 12 points and five rebounds per game. In game three, he had turned back the clock by unloading 24 points and 13 boards on the Pistons. With Kareem sitting, Detroit finished off the Lakers. Four seconds left. He's got the ball. He should have it. Isaiah hangs out of the ball, flips it up to the Raptors. Detroit is the city of champions again. as one of the greatest defensive teams ever in the history of this league. A victorious team that battled all the way to a seventh game last year before losing, and this year they have done it four in a row. And now comes time to award the presentation of the trophy, the commissioner of the NBA, David Stern, and the fine owner, Bill Davidson of the Pistons. Bill, it was a long time in coming, but you've got a very deserving championship team. Congratulations to you, the Pistons, and the city of Detroit. Let's get Ben terrific, Grant. Uh, you know, we fought for 15 years to do this. The last three have been real tough in the finals. Uh, as you know, we were here last year trying to do it, but uh, it, it's great, and the harder you work, the better it is. It was... It's like you had died and gone to heaven. I remember singing Ohio Players' song, Heaven Must Be Like This. 
heaven. <laughs> like the Ohio player said, heaven must be like this. Heaven must be like Because it wasn't, it wasn't a joyous moment. It wasn't a, a moment of celebration. It was a moment of relief. You know, it's like, I was just, I remember after winning it, I was just so tired. You know, I was just physically and emotionally just drained. I mean, I was just so tired. You know, it's like I had been pushing and pushing and pushing and so intense and so, and finally like when it happened, you know, I just, I just remember just feeling, you know, a release. You know, it wasn't, it was a release. Long road for the Pistons, Hubie. Oh, I was just wanting to get to the locker room and drink the champagne. <laughs> we had really experienced the uh, championship the year before when we lost the Lakers. Uh, we knew what it was about. We knew what to, uh, what to expect when you won. Um, it was actually a relief for many of us because we didn't fail in our quest. So now it's time to have some fun and have a party and uh, drink a few bottles of champagne. They allowed under 93 points a game. Well, I remember my hair was nappy. I had a beard. I smelled funny, but I still ran over and picked up Isaiah, and uh, who was yelling at me. And James Worthy had like 42 points, and he wanted to smack me in the head. But I picked him up, and uh, I was the happiest cat there ever could be. I mean, I didn't want to take my uniform off. Dennis wound up not taking a shower, taking his uniform off until the next day or the day after that. I can, I can remember the stench, but. Uh, <laughs> I had a, I mean, it was a feeling of accomplishment. I don't even know what was even better. Joe, I, I've got a moment to get you over here. And just such a solid, gutty performance on your part. Congratulations. Thanks a lot. Uh, we worked hard for it. Uh, that was our purpose coming into this season. From day one, we wanted to get here, and here we are. It was great. You know, I was maybe 26 years old, uh, fourth year in the league, and I was MVP of the finals. Uh, as a young player at that particular time, it's, it's, it's everything that you can dream of as a player. To win the world championship, you be the MVP of the finals. Uh, any young player in the league would tell you right now that that would be his number one dream, to win the championship and to be the MVP on top of it. Uh, for me, it was, it was absolutely incredible at that particular time in my life. Uh, now that I look back on it, um, I'm a little bit more nostalgic about it. Uh, I tend to look at the list of MVPs uh, who came before me and after me since then, and uh, it's some very good company on that list, and uh, I'm more proud of it now probably than, uh, than what I was at that particular time. At that time, I was just kind of excited about it. Now I'm a little bit more nostalgic and a little bit more proud about it right now. And right now, let's take a scene up at the Palace of Auburn Hill. And they're going wild up there. Over 20,000 screaming fans packed the Palace for Game 3 and 4 to watch the network feed on Palace Vision. The team was greeted at the airport like returning war heroes. Two days later, thousands of fans lined the streets of downtown Detroit for a victory parade. Later that afternoon, the Palace was the site of another championship rally. In 1980, this team won 16 ball games. Bill was called a loser, the general manager was a loser, the players were losers, the coaches were losers. And I say this to you, Champions are sometimes losers that just will not quit. First and foremost, I'd like to thank you for your support through the good days and, and the bad days. But I think what says it all is that term, what brings tears to my eyes is when you say world champions. The best basketball team in the world, right here, right here. Instead of us 
Instead of you clapping for us as a basketball team, what we like to do is have all of you be quiet just for 10 seconds and let us give you a hand. Throughout this entire year and in previous years, they've called me and some of my teammates a bunch of thugs. A lot of the other opposing fans have called us a lot of names that you can't print. Everybody calls us the bad boys. I call ourselves world champions. Thank you. I'd like to thank all you guys for coming out. We worked really hard for this all year. We felt all year that we would win it. Uh, they gave me the MVP. And I think every guy here is the most valuable player because we have a great team. Thank you, guys. I just thank God, I, I fought, I done fought through a lot of things to get where I am today, but I'd like to thank the people in the organization, all these guys right here for giving me the opportunity to play with them, and I love everybody here today. This is one of those emotional times where, you know, it's, um, exciting moment in your life where you really don't, I really didn't know what the hell was really going on. I was just pretty much just in the mix of everything, you know. First three years of my um, career as a, as a basketball player, winning a championship is very rare to do, so it was very difficult for me to, uh, to suck it all up and all at once. But uh, I, I got adjust, I, I adjusted to it real well. During the parade and championship rally, the Pistons were dealt some bad news. Rick Mahorn, one of the original bad boys, had been selected in the expansion draft. I, I really didn't enjoy it, and, and I didn't enjoy it because I knew we were going to lose a very good player in the expansion draft. And we lost Rick Mahorn. Rick had, a, at that time, we were all concerned about his back, and uh, he was one of four guys that had to be on the expansion list, we could we could protect eight guys, and uh, during our parade, the first parade, I have a phone on one of the floats going down, you know, uh, to downtown Detroit, and I'm on the phone all the time talking to teams, the expansion teams, uh, saying we'll give you uh, draft choices, you know, don't select any of these guys and so forth, but. Uh, didn't work out. We lost a good player, and and I didn't enjoy it at all. And I know it was disappointing for him. I had to tell him, and it, it was crushing. It was crushing to everybody. And I think the timing by the league was was very bad. It was, I think, the day after, or two days after we won the championship, that it had to be announced. And uh, you know, they, they could have waited. And there was there was no hurry in this. And uh, I told the commissioner about that, but uh, there was no way that they were going to wait. It was a high, you know, from a high to the lowest of lows because uh, at that time you felt, well, you had to put things in perspective. It was a business, and it was a business deal that was just going down. I was left unprotected, you know, but I was still a champion. And I think last year with my experience of being back in Detroit, I was on my honeymoon. And it, it took me, you know, it took me six, seven years to get back, but I was back to play. And it felt good to the response of the fans because the fans never forgot about me. The team would never be the same. Though the Pistons had another championship on the horizon, it would not be the bad boy. You know, today, um, I guess, was the last straw in the end for all of us. 
uh, in terms of our bad boy image. Uh, you know, we were 12 guys who were together, who worked hard all season long, who's worked hard for the last three years. And uh, one of us is gone now. Uh, Rick Mahorn's not here. So, therefore, we can no longer uh, have the same type of basketball team that we had last year. And we will no longer be called the Bad Boys. From this day on, we'll be called the Detroit Pistons. It's hard to believe it's been 10 years since that team's been together at the Palace. It will happen again later this coming season, though. All the bad boys will be back together in a special ceremony at the Palace. Call your sales representative or call 248-377-0100. If you renew by July 1st, you'll receive a very special surprise limited edition gift from the bad boys. Remember, all season long, in addition to Coach Gentry and company battling the best in the NBA, we will be honoring the 1989 championship team. Each month, individuals from that squad will be brought back to the Palace to meet the fans, remember the great moments from that season, and take their place in Pistons history. Many great giveaways and presentations inside the Palace are planned all season long to commemorate the 1989 bad boys. It'll be the talk of the town. Renew today to guarantee yourself a seat for all the fun, excitement, and history. It's going to be something very special. That phone number again, 248-377-0100. I'm George Blaha. See you during the season.